So thanks again for everyone participating for today's webinar. So today we're gonna to be talking about how transplant affects thinking. So Dr. Engel will be sharing what is cognitive impairment, how end-stage organ failure affects cognition in transplant patients, what to expect uh, post-transplant, and also how can your families and caregivers um, prepare to help. So I'm just gonna go through a few slides before we get to Dr. Engel. So some quick housekeeping, this is being recorded. So if you have to log off early, um, we'll send out a recorded copy to um, those who are participating today. Please feel free to chat through the chat box if you wanna share a little bit about your transplant story, um, do so in the chat. Make sure you do click to um, all attendees and panelists so that all attendees can see. Um, and then all of your questions really should go through the Q&A box. The chat box moves pretty quickly, so we won't really be able to track questions there. So please make sure to put your questions in Q&A. And um, just one disclaimer, um, if you do have questions about your specific transplant care or medical care, um, Dr. Engel will not be able to answer those specifically. So um, please speak to your transplant team or your medical team about anything related specifically to your own care. So really quickly, I'm gonna go through um, how we're um, uh, putting these programs on. So our programs are through the Gift of Life Family House. It's an organ or it's a home away from home for transplant patients and families who travel to Philadelphia for their transplant care. So patients and families at any stage of the transplant process can stay with us um, while they receive care at a local transplant center. We offer meals every night, uh, support with transportation, and we have social workers on staff to to support um, with all of the emotional ups and downs of the transplant process. We also offer a lot of support via a caregiver um, lifeline program, which is primarily online. Um, these webinars and other support groups are through this program and it is available to anyone, anywhere, regardless of whether you stayed at the Gift of Life Family House. So to note, our next webinar is on Tuesday, so just a few days from now at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time about post-transplant skin cancer. We have other um, past um, webinars on our website, as well as some online support groups and Zoom support groups. So really quickly before I would like to thank our sponsor today. So CSL Bearings, a global biotech leader driven by their promise to save and improve lives. Their ability to innovate and deliver life-saving medicines for patients with rare disease and other un unmet medical needs around the world has earned them a reputation for always putting patients first. They see a significant unmet need in transplantation and are committed to delivering innovative solutions to address them. So before I introduce Dr. Engel, I do want to let you know we are doing a raffle for everyone who participates today. So at the very end of the program, that person will be selected. So now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Engel. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so she could share hers. So Dr. Christy Engel is a clinical health psychologist at the, the I should say the Ohio State University Wexner, Wexner Medical Center, where she works with pre and post kidney, pancreas, liver, heart, and lung transplant patients. She obtained her doctoral degree from Roosevelt University, completed her pre-doctoral internship at the Memphis VA at the Memphis VA and her postdoctorate fellowship at the Cleveland VA. Dr. Engel has presented on various aspects of transplant regionally and nationally and has co-authored several transplant specific book chapters. So thank you so much, Dr. Engel, for being with us today. Thank you for that introduction. I'm, I'm happy to be here today and, and to be presenting to you all. Um, I, uh, first started talking about cognition with my own transplant team here, giving a grand round. And then that spread into um, presenting at the uh, social work conference. And I'm happy to, to be here today and to share some of this information with the folks who really need it, with our patients and, and the caregivers. Um, so thank you for, for having me and um, pleased to see that there's been so, um, so much attention to this topic, um, so much response. 
uh, it means that it's an important one and it's something that we should be talking more about. So thank you for the opportunity to do that today. Um, I have no uh, financial disclosures or conflicts of interest. And here are our objectives um, for our time together. Um, so I'll define cognitive impairment. Hopefully you'll be able to kind of recognize the ways in which end stage organ failure can affect cognition. Um, I'll discuss how transplant can affect cognitive functioning. So both on the pre side, as well as the post side um, and how to prepare and what, what you can do um, to kind of sustain your cognitive functioning. So first, let's talk uh, about cognitive functioning. So when uh, we were going back and forth about how to name this talk, um, we called it thinking. Um, and I will say that we know transplant can change your thinking, such as you know, your, your perspective, your priorities, your values, and reflection. Um, but that is a separate topic and a separate talk. So we're, when I talk about thinking today, we're talking about cognitive functioning. And so first let's just define that. So that's the mental processes that are involved in the acquisition of knowledge. So learning, uh, manipulation of information and reasoning. So that's our fancy definition here for our fancy word. Um, and it includes the following domains, per perception, memory, learning, attention, decision-making and language abilities. And I go through those pretty quickly because we're gonna talk about each one of those in more detail to have a have a good understanding about some of these uh, domains. So uh, these are the domains, various domains of cognitive functioning. So thinking first about perceptual motor function. Um, so this is visual perception, kind of just what what you see, being able to identify it. Um, visual constructional reasoning. Um, so this is really the idea of if you, you know, you see a table that only has two legs, understanding that something's not quite right and that that's not going to work out or the table's going to fall over. So that's kind of the reasoning part of that. Um, and perceptual motor coordination. So this is um, being able to, you know, figure out how to reach out, pick up a, a cup of water and, and take a sip from that. Um, so that's our perceptual motor function. And when I think about, um, you know, transplant patients and, and a skill that might be related to this domain, I think about being able to fill a pill box um, and do so accurately. So our next domain is language. Um, the first is object naming, word fluency, um, grammar and syntax. So being able to find the words that you want to say, um, and being able to put those together in a meaningful way that follows kind of the rules, um, as well as receptive language. So being able to take in um, the, what someone else is saying and be able to understand that. Um, and so when I think about this particular domain and, and transplant patients, I think about um, not only being able to just kind of communicate with your providers, but thinking about, you know, being able to identify your symptoms and, and explain those in a way that your provider can, can understand, um, as well as, you know, being able to receive the information that they're telling you and be able to process that information or those instructions. Um, our next domain is learning and memory. Um, so that one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, free recall, being able to just kind of pull that information from your memory. Um, cued recall, so if there is something that, you know, kind of cues you or alerts you to that particular memory or recognizing um, when someone something is presented to you. Um, it also is our memory of our lives, our auto autobiographical memory, um, that long-term memory. Um, and so thinking about this for our patients, it's, you know, remembering those instructions that um, your provider gave you when you were at your appointment last uh, yesterday, when you go home and have to change things around in that pill box. Um, so being able to hold on to and then pull out some of that information that you've learned previously. Um, the next domain is social cognition. Um, so this is the recognition of emotions um, of your own as well as in someone else, um, theory of mind. And what that is, is, is kind of perspective taking. So being able to kind of put yourself into someone else's shoes and understand at least a little bit of what that experience might look like. Um, 
and insight. So having some insight into one's own abilities and insight into um, one's own emotions. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's pretty clear that that this domain is important for patients and in interactions with um, their care team, but also interactions with, you know, their family and their caregivers. And our next domain is complex attention. Um, so this is sustained attention, being able to kind of stay focused, concentrate, um, divided attention, selective attention, being able to choose kind of what is the most important thing to pay attention to when there might be multiple things going on um, that are uh, pulling for your attention. Um, and also included in here is processing speed. So how quickly are you able to process the information that you are attending to? Um, and I think the, the most common example um, of a skill in this domain is driving, right? Because you're, you're driving down the road, there's lots of things going on. You have to choose which one of those to pay attention to at any given time. You have to process the information that's coming in. So the, you know, the person in front of you, you see their brake lights come on. You have to be able to be attending to that first, um, to have chosen accurately to attend to that particular thing, and then to process that information to figure out what actions you should take next, such as, you know, hitting your brakes. Um, and then our final uh, domain here is executive functioning. And so we call this kind of higher order thinking. Um, and so it's the planning, it's the decision making, um, working memory, so holding things in your brain and, and kind of um, manipulating them, responding to feedback, inhibition, uh, being able to inhibit actions or thoughts or things like that that um, aren't necessarily helpful for you in that moment, um, and also mental flexibility. Um, so being able to kind of take a different perspective, think about things differently, um, that sort of thing. And so in this domain, I think it's particularly important for a task such as um, arranging for transportation to get your labs drawn. So it involves some planning, obviously, and some decision making. Who's going to take me to get my labs drawn after transplant? Um, what time do I take my medications? Because your labs are timed with when you take your, your medications. And then it takes me 30 minutes to get there. And so I take my medications at eight o'clock and I need to get my labs drawn at seven. So I need to leave at 6.30 and I need to call transportation two days in advance. So all of that kind of planning and, and organization are in that executive functioning domain. So you can see how that one is, is, is quite important. Um, all right. So what then is cognitive impairment? We just talked about all of those domains of neurocognitive functioning. What is cognitive impairment? And I will say that, you know, this, this idea or this word or other descriptions of it do get tossed around quite frequently, um, both by patients and by providers without having a particular definition or a uh, um, an agreed upon meaning of what that is. And so I'm gonna give you the agreed upon meaning of what that is. These are the clinical kind of definitions of, of neurocognitive disorders. Um, and so a mild neurocognitive disorder is evidence of modest decline in one or more of those cognitive domains. So we went over those first so that you can kind of build on that. So in one or more of those areas of cognitive functioning, the patient exhibits some sort of a, a decline. So a decline from where they were previously. And so that's not to say like maybe they, they have a low baseline of cognitive functioning and they've just kind of stayed at that low baseline. That's not the same. We're talking a, a decline from where they previously were um, that is identifiable. However, these deficits in a mild neurocognitive disorder, they don't interfere with day-to-day -day activities. So that person with that mild disorder is still able to do all of the things that they had previously been able to do. Um, and this is, uh, occurs in about two to 10% of, of adults 65 years and older. And that's all adults, not just you know, transplant patients here. Um, so two to 10% experience some decline from their previous level of functioning as they age. 
a major neurocognitive disorder is evidence of a significant decline in one or more cognitive domains. So, and these deficits do interfere with functioning. Um, and this is less common only in about one to 2% of adults who are 65 years or older. Um, and again, there's, there's quite a distinction here. And that distinction is really how it affects your day-to-day -day life. Um, and I think that's why, you know, we were talking about this topic to begin with is because we know that your cognitive functioning can impact not only just kind of what um, activities you're able to do on your own or what you might need help with, but also can impact your quality of life. All right. And so, you know, why, why are we talking about this? Why was this a, a topic for presentation in, in the world of transplant? Um, transplant patients are vulnerable to, um, to cognitive impairment. One or more organ systems is failing, right? Um, and transplant patients often have other medical conditions, other medical comorbidities. So it's not just that, um, you know, you have heart failure and you need a heart, but maybe you also have diabetes. Um, it's quite common for there to be kind of more than one condition that patients are trying to manage as they go into end stage organ failure. Um, you're also on a lot of medications, um, both on the pre side and on post transplant side. Um, and I will say I'm not going to, to talk specifically about the impact of particular medications. One, because there's just not um, solidified or concrete evidence um, or discoveries about exactly how they how these medications affect cognition. Um, but two, because that would take its own whole hour. Um, so we don't have time to kind of go into all of those details. Um, transplant patients do also often have co-occurring mental health conditions. Um, depression and anxiety occur in up to 70% of patients who are going through the transplant process. Um, and so we know that those can also affect um, your thinking, your ability to kind of concentrate and pay attention, which then can affect your memory. Um, and so those are also making transplant patients vulnerable to cognitive impairment. Um, and this is, you know, this is not to, to scare you. This is to prepare you. Um, you're here for information and I applaud you for that. Um, you know, it's important that you have a good understanding about what this is and what to expect and, and what you can do. Um, and so now I'm going to take some time just to kind of talk um, organ specific information and we'll go through um, kind of the pre side for each organ and then we'll talk about the post side for each organ and then kind of wrap up with um, some general comments of things that you can do. All right, so on the pre side for our kidney transplant folks here, this is pre transplant. Um, about 50 to 80% of dialysis patients have cognitive impairment. Um, and I will say the caveat here that we just talked about the very technical definitions of a mild and a major neurocognitive disorder. And unfortunately, not all, all of the researchers do that. So when I say things like cognitive impairment, they're just saying that compared to other people of their age and education, these patients are impaired. And I'll try and be specific about what we mean by these different terms as I'm going through it. Um, and I, I apologize, I'm gonna use a little bit of jargon here to the, some of the organ specific things that we talk about, but I imagine that all of the transplant patients and, and those involved in their care are quite familiar with a lot of the terminology that I'll be using here. It's things that you talk about all the time. Um, so again, um, this is about, you know, pretty significant number of dialysis patients are showing some impairment in their cognitive functioning compared to healthy controls. Um, we also know that prior to going on dialysis that with end stage kidney failure that um, something called uremia happens where those toxins that your, your kidneys are supposed to um, clean out that they start to build up in your body and that they can contribute to some impairment in your cognition as well. I've had patients um, describe it to me just as kind of like a gen general slowing or mental fogginess um, that can improve with dialysis. But we are still seeing some impairment even with dialysis doing the job of your kidneys. 
Um, the domains that are most affected in this population are verbal learning, memory, and executive functioning. So again, the executive functioning is those higher order skills of, of kind of planning and organization. Um, the severity of cognitive impairment was related to the severity of the renal dysfunction as measured by the EGFR. So this is where the jargon is. I know all my kidney folks out there know what the GFR is, but um, it's basically the how much your kidneys are functioning, how much they're filtering out. And so as the kidneys are functioning at a lower rate, then cogn cognition actually goes down as well. Um, and that kind of makes sense, right? Uh, as your disease progresses, as your kidneys aren't working as well, then your brain starts to get a bit, uh, bit more foggy and you have more difficulty in those cognitive domains. Um, these researchers uh, attributed this to some vascular um, alterations, so a kind of blood flow changes, um, chronic inflammation and other comorbid conditions. So things like diabetes and hypertension that can affect your cognitive functioning and can affect your brain, even if you're not in kidney failure or on dialysis. All right. Um, so now we'll talk about our heart transplant patients on the pre side. Um, up to 40% of these patients were impaired on at least one task. So in this research, they gave them various tasks to test the different cognitive domains that we talked about. Um, and about almost half had impairment on at least one of those tasks. Um, these are the domains that are most commonly affected um, for pre-heart transplant patients processing speed, um, so how quickly you're processing information, immediate and delayed figure recall. So this is a, one of those specific tasks that I was talking about, but this is um, you know, where you would see an image and then have to remember it immediately after you saw it and then remember it again in say 10 minutes. Um, and so you can see how that could kind of play out in day-to-day -day life as well. Um, and then sustained and divided attention uh, and nonverbal reasoning. So interestingly, unlike our, our kidney folks, where their kidney function was associated with the degree of cognitive impairment, for our heart transplant patients, um, the ejection fraction alone was not a good predictor. And I know my, my heart transplant patients know all about their EF and have been following their percentages, um, but this alone wasn't a good predictor of the cognitive impairment, which I think is kind of interesting because it, it makes almost practical sense that it would be um, that, you know, kind of the amount of blood that your heart is able to pump um, and essentially get to your brain um, is not predicting how cognitively impaired you are. And I don't think they, they're not saying that it's completely unrelated, but just that at alone on its own, it wasn't a good predictor that the, the picture is a bit more complex there. All right. And for our, our lung transplant patients, um, I will give the, the caveat here um, that there aren't as many uh, lung transplant patients as there are, say, kidney transplant patients, which make up about 50% of all transplants done. Um, and it, specifically with some of the studies in cognition, there's just not that many patients involved, which makes it less generalizable, meaning that it might be something that is more particular to the patients that were included in the study, and we're not quite sure how much it applies to everybody else who is going through the lung transplant process. So I just wanted to mention that um, because there were only about 42 patients included in some of the studies here. Um, but in, those, in that sample, about 82% had mild cognitive impairment. And remember, that's you know, kind of showing a decline from that previous level of functioning, um, but not necessarily um, impairing their day-to-day -day functioning. However, 39% had a moderate to severe cognitive impairment, meaning they showed a pretty significant decline from their previous level of functioning and that it was impacting their ability to complete day-to-day -day tasks. So the domains that are most affected for our lung transplant patients, I think are quite interesting. Um, problem solving, psychomotor speed, simple motor functions, and memory. And so the, you know, the psychomotor speed and simple motor functions, there's, that's a lot of that um, 
kind of sensory motor stuff that we were talking about earlier and in, in that particular domain. Um, so this is kind of, um, you know, those, those kind of uh, small motor functions, such as like picking up a fork or something like that, as well as how quickly you're able to, to do those tasks. Um, and for our lung patients, this was uh, correlated with the level of hypoxemia. So that kind of low level of oxygen in your brain was related to the level of cognitive impairment. And that again, you know, kind of makes sense, right? If your brain is not, if there's not a lot of oxygen in your blood, then your brain is not getting a lot of oxygen and it needs that just as, you know, the rest of your body does. Um, so it makes sense that those two things are, are related. Okay. So I saved our liver um, for last year uh, because it's a bit more complicated um, for our liver patients. And that is because uh, what all the liver folks will know about is hepatic encephalopathy. Um, and so this is where ammonia can build up in your brain um, and cause confusion, disorientation, erratic behaviors. Uh, and about 30 to 45% of patients who have cirrhosis have at least one episode um, of hepatic encephalopathy while they're waitlisted for transplant. So it's quite common. And you can see here up to 84% have subclinical hepatic encephalopathy. So maybe not these kind of big overt episodes um, where you know it's it's very apparent what's going on, but just kind of a subclinical, maybe a high ammonia level and and some mental slowing or fogginess or some subtle, more subtle changes in behavior or temperament. Um, but even that minimal hepatic encephalopathy impairs work and social functioning, and it's associated with compromised um, blood to the brain. Um, so that's why things get a little tricky with our liver patients because, you know, at the time of testing, we don't know kind of their level of hepatic encephalopathy. So we don't know if it's this kind of um, just more acute thing that is happening for them or if it is because, um, you know, they have cirrhosis uh, or, you know, so it just makes it a bit more complicated to kind of tease out there. Um, the domains that are most impaired for our liver transplant patients prior to transplant are attention, again, that psychomotor speed, memory, and executive functioning. And these researchers suggest that these things are impaired with or without um, experiences of hepatic encephalopathy, um, even though about 80, like I said, 85% have that subclinical experience. They're, they're saying that there is still impairment whether you've had um, whether you've had hepatic encephalopathy or not. Um, there is some controversy about the long-term effects of hepatic encephalopathy on cognitive functioning, but there is some research to suggest that it can cause um, some long-term effects and impairment. Um, and so the best thing is to make sure that, you know, you're kind of well managing those symptoms with the medications that your team is providing you. Um, because even though, you know, your brain does clear up when that encephalopathy um, is cleared, we do know that there, there is likely some longer term implications for having experienced that. All right, so that is on our pre side. Um, and so let's talk about after transplant and kind of what you can expect after you go through the transplant process. So for our kidney folks, um, we did see significant within subject pre to post improvement. Um, and what that means is that they actually tested the same patients when they were listed for a transplant and then after they got the transplant and they compared them to themselves. Um, so if they, they looked at Joe's score prior to him getting a kidney and they looked at Joe's score after he got a kidney and Joe got better. He did a lot better. Um, and the, they were showing most improvements in motor speed, spatial reasoning and verbal and visual memory. So those areas were showing significant improvement after the transplant when you compare one person to themselves pre and post. Um, 
However, there were still some deficits in executive functioning, attention, and language when they were compared to healthy controls. So Joe, he improved his score from pre-getting a kidney to when he got a kidney, but Joe after transplant is still impaired compared to X person who never had a kidney transplant. Okay. So he got better compared to himself, but still showing some impairment compared to someone who's never gone through a transplant. Um, and what the researchers had suggested here were that maybe some of those metabolic and vascular um, blood flow changes from having chronic kidney disease result in some non-reversible consequences to the brain. So the fact that you know you had um, you had kidney disease, it did some did some damage to the brain um, that can't be reversed now that you have a new and good functioning kidney. Um, so I think the good news is though here that we were seeing you know up to eighty plus percent of patients who are on dialysis having impaired cognitive functioning, and that a majority of those patients are seeing improvement after the transplant. Okay, for our heart uh, transplant patients post, um, 38, 39% uh, um, did have some impaired test performance. So again, at least on one test, um, but only 30% were um, having mild cognitive impairment. So that would be, you know, really a detectable decline from a previous level of functioning. And they didn't make mention of anyone with major cognitive impairment. So that idea that, um, that their cognition is impaired to the point where it's interfering with their day-to-day -day life or functioning. Excuse me. Um, and the uh, domains that um, continue to be impaired for these patients were in processing speed, executive functioning, memory, and language functions. For our lung transplant patients, um, after transplant, about 67% had mild cognitive impairment, and only about 5% had moderate cognitive impairment. 29% um, exhibited a cognitive decline post-transplant, but the majority experienced improvement from pre to post. So there is a small subset of patients um, that do experience some cognitive decline after transplant. And, you know, the researchers didn't spell this out exactly, but it's likely related to complications that patients um, had post-transplant. So things like requiring reintubation or um, uh, additional surgical procedures, needing dialysis, things like that that um, not the transplant itself, but kind of some of the repercussions of that and, and the recovery process that can have insults um, to their cognitive function. And for our liver folks, um, we do see significant improvement after transplant in most cognitive domains with the exception of attention, which um, there is still some noted impairment in attentional abilities post liver transplant. The degree of improvement was higher for patients who had had those overt episodes of hepatic encephalopathy. So if, if um, a patient had had that prior to the transplant, had had HE prior, then they actually improved much uh, more than patients who hadn't had the HE beforehand. Um, but those patients do still remain impaired compared to um, those who didn't have the hepatic encephalopathy and, and in, compared to healthy controls. So again, it's, it's the idea of looking at one person and their pre-transplant score compared to their own post-transplant score or comparing their post-transplant score to the rest of the population. Um, and about 20% of our liver transplant patients did continue to show impairment with attention being um, the most common domain that remains impaired after transplant. 
So what are the predictors? How do we know who's going to have cognitive impairment after transplant? Um, and I will tell you that we don't know for sure, right? Um, I, I often say in my clinic that I don't have a crystal ball or a magic wand. Um, and, and I don't have either, and the research doesn't either. So um, to, our, to the best of our knowledge, these are the things that are associated with um, cognitive impairment after transplant. So people of older age um, are more likely to have cognitive impairment after transplant. Um, and that's true kind of just in, in general, right? We know that our older population is more likely to have a neurocognitive disorder. Some of that is just kind of based on, on normal aging processes. Um, comorbidities, so the, the number and the severity of other health conditions also is related to cognitive impairment after transplant. So like we were talking about before, the person who has heart failure and also has diabetes, when they get a new heart, they still have diabetes. Um, and so it's those uh, comorbidities that kind of um, make the patient more vulnerable. Um, Pre-morbid cognitive functioning. So what that means is, how is your brain doing 20 years ago? Or you know, when, when you were growing up, when you were younger? Um, and I like to think about this as kind of like having a reserve, right? If you think about, um, if you blow up a balloon and it's all the way full, right? If, if you've got all of the cognitive functioning, a full balloon, um, and you let out a little bit of air because you, you, know, you had, had a disease or something like that that um, has affected your cognition. You let out a little bit of air, that balloon's still pretty big, right? Um, however, if you only blow the balloon up halfway and you kind of only start with this and then you let out some air, then that balloon gets pretty small. And so if you have more reserve to begin with, you kind of have some more space to lose a little bit and not be impacted. Um, and then as we talked about going through each organ, the organ specific functioning and complications. So, um, you know, things like uh, your EGFR and hypoxemia and things like that, um, that we had talked about for each particular organ. So what, what can you do? Um, it's not all doom and gloom, I promise. And, and one of the most important things that you can do is to educate yourself so that you can be prepared um, and have appropriate expectations. Um, and you're doing that now. So I'll applaud you again for being here today. Um, what else can you do? So you can take care of your health. I think I've said it a bunch of times throughout this, but you know, all of those chronic conditions that you have can really impact your brain. Um, we are a whole body, right? Our brains are connected to every other part of our body. And so how we take care of that and how we treat that can really have an effect on, on our cognition. Um, take your medications, keep your appointments, monitor your vitals, follow your diet, all of those things that the rest of your transplant team is telling you to do. Um, to take good care of all of your health conditions, including your mental health. Um, stay socially active, engage in your hobbies and in good self-care activities. Seek counseling or medications for your mood if you need them. Um, as we talked about before, your mental health can impact your cognitive functioning as well as the rest of your health and your ability to care for it. So make sure that you're taking care and paying attention to that as well. Sleep and nutrition are all also very important. If you don't get enough sleep and nutrition, your body can't really do much else. Um, and so those remain very important to kind of prioritize. There's also some kind of tips and tricks that you can use. We call them compensatory strategies. So our brains are not limitless. We all have a limit on the number of things that we are able to remember, um, to keep track of, and our brains get tired too. And so if you can use some of these strategies, kind of put them into place to give your brain a little rest um, and, and to help out so that you, know, you can make sure that you're doing all you need to do to take care of your health, um, that can be very helpful. So setting an alarm, you know, you can have a recurring alarm on your phone that tells you when to take your medications. Um, use a pillbox. Then you know that if 
the Monday box is empty, you took your pills for Monday, rather than sitting there and wondering, did I take my pills? Did I not take my pills? And then it becomes difficult to concentrate on something else. Just kind of simplify that. Keep a calendar, use checklists, um, visual reminders. So I often um, tell my patients who have diabetes, you know, put a little, put a little sticky note or something in the drawer with your forks. Um, because then you remember that when you go to pick up a fork and you go to eat, you have your little sticky note that says, take your blood, take your blood sugar or take your insulin. Um, so applying some of those visual reminders and ask for help when you need it. Um, you know, you have, we, we include caregivers in part of transplant for a reason. And it's because we know that this is, um, can be an overwhelming process for some. Keep your brain active. Um, so things like mental math or memory games, crosswords, Sudoku, um, even things like journaling, um, listening to music, talking with someone, those all activate different parts of your brain and keep it active. And when your brain is used and it's activated, it starts building pathways. And the more that you travel on those pathways, they become not just little footpaths, but like highways where information can then travel faster and more easily uh, get back and forth to different parts of your brain. And so the more that you use it, those pathways get well worn. Um, and these, you know, little things that you can do that are also, you know, fun or entertaining can just kind of continue to activate those pathways so that they remain active or that they rebuild. Um, using the non-dominant hand. So that's kind of building a new pathway there. If you're not used to brushing your hair with your right hand and you do it one day, that part of your brain just kind of sparks up and says, hey, okay, we gotta figure out how to do this now. Um, so that can just be, you know, something fun to, to try and do um, to activate new, new pathways, new areas of your brain. Um, Remember that some impairment, and I put that in quotes, impairment is normal. Um, our brains are not video recorders. Um, you know, we can't keep absolute track of everything that happens and put it in a box somewhere and pull it out fully intact. Um, even the most intact person uh, forgets where they put their keys sometimes, right? And so it's important to remember um, that uh, your brain is not perfect and no one's is. Um, I think a, a lot of times transplant patients, as they go through this process, they can become kind of vigilant or keenly aware of everything that is going on with their body. And you know, patients can tell me that their left big toe twinged twice last night. Um, because you just become keenly aware of what's going on with your body or, or, or can. Um, and that's true for, for cognitive functioning as well, where you become just kind of keyed in a little bit to look out for anything that might go wrong. Um, and so that's why I say it's important to remember that everyone misplaces their keys every once in a while, right? Um, ask for and accept help when you need it. Um, that's what your caregiver is there for. That's what friends and family are there for. That's what your transplant team is there for. If you need help, ask for it. Um, but also do what you are capable of doing. Um, maybe it might take you 20 minutes to fill your pill box after transplant. And you know somebody else over there, it might take them five. But you're capable of doing it. So do those things for yourself if you're able to do them. And then maybe you have somebody else check it just to make sure everything's accurate. But again, just kind of engaging in those activities can build and activate those pathways. Um, and talk to your provider if you're having concerns. Um, they might consider neuropsychological testing, which would be a few hours of doing some paper and pencil tests or computer tests to tell what things might be more difficult or easier for you. Um, and at times they may suggest um, cognitive rehabilitation. Um, so working on some of those cognition, cognition skills um, to help you build back um, some of the functioning that you had before. And that is all I have for you. This is a, a picture of our pinwheel garden that we have here at OSU every year um, for our transplant patients. And 
we we plant a pinwheel for every transplant that we've created here. It's really or that we've done here. Sorry, it's really a a cool thing. Um, and our transplant patients are able to come and interact with um, with the teams and uh, see each other again. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Engel. That was amazing and um, so much information. And we have a lot of questions. So we're gonna do our best to get through as many questions as possible. And in the event we can't, um, Dr. Nangle and I can talk uh, afterwards. And if there's general information or resources we can send, we'll do that. Um, so the first question someone had asked, are there certain domains that are more impaired than others? Uh, for instance, their language and memory are terrible post-transplant. Yeah, I think, you know, it it depends on a lot of things. And as we went through, um, you know, we talked about the particular domains for each of the particular organs. And there are a lot of, of differences by organ. So I think that that is one of the main things that can tell you which domains are typically impaired. Um, but it also depends on other things like comorbidities, right? What, what else do you have going on um, that might be impacting your cognitive functioning? Um, and so it's, it's difficult to say for certain that these are the ones that are going to be impaired also because each person is, is individual. But I think we did kind of go through a little bit of a rundown on the pre and post side of the particular domains for each organ group to kind of look out for. Yeah. Um, and again, this will be uh, emailed to participants so you can go back and focus more on your specific organ. Um, so someone asked, what is the position on taking supplements to improve memory, such as Nariva? Um, I will direct that to your transplant team, um, because we know that anything you put into your body, um, whether it's a supplement or natural or, you know, even if it's water, right, it can have some kind of effect and interaction. Um, and so that would be something to discuss with your specific provider and they can talk to you about any concerns or interactions that they might have. Great, thank you. Um, and someone had asked, this is a I think might be a little bit of a bigger question. And I do want to preface it by saying that in June, we're having two webinars again that are focusing more on the emotional um, aspects of transplant um, around survivor's guilt and also um, the losses that uh, families experience um, around transplant. Um, but the question is, um, how do you uh, support patients or how can patients support themselves who are waiting for long durations of time for transplant and struggling with anxiety and depression? Yeah, that is a that is a pretty big question. And I, I'm glad to hear that you are having some webinars coming up to address kind of the emotional aspect of this, because we know that that's huge, right? Um, there are a reason that um, there are psychologists and social workers and psychiatrists as part of transplant teams. Um, and, and the waiting can be some of the hardest, right? Once you get through the, you know, you get through the evaluation process and then you're just waiting and you don't know how long and you don't know when it's going to happen. Um, and, you know, the way that, that listing works, patients have to get sicker before they're able to get a transplant, right? And so I know that that can be um, a really difficult time for patients. And I would say in general, turn to your supports, you know, turn to the people that you have um, to rely on your caregivers, your friends, your family, your faith communities. Um, there are also lots of transplant specific um, support groups. So either through your transplant center or through your organ procurement organization, um, you can find some, some valuable resources to talk with other patients who are going through, you know, something similar with, I, which I think is a really valuable resource. Sometimes it's helpful just to be able to talk with someone who really knows, you know, kind of what it is that that you're experiencing and can speak with you about that. Um, and there are many mental health professionals throughout the country um, that would be happy to talk with you as well, many of whom are now doing Zoom. Um, so you don't even have to have to leave yeah. your house to get that that sort of support. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the next question, um, would there be pre-transplant um, cognitive impairment potentially cause worry for a dialysis patient to go on home dialysis? 
So I think what you're saying, um, would cognitive impairment be concerning for someone um, to do home dialysis? That's, that's a great question. Um, and so I think the answer is, as it, as it typically is, it depends. Um, it depends on the level of, of cognitive impairment and if that is impacting their functioning. Um, you know, if they have seen just kind of a, a modest decline from where they were previously, but they're still able to manage things successfully on their own, then I mean, that would, that would be fine. They're still able to manage um, what, they, what they have to do. I think the other aspect of it um, would be who do they have at home who might be able to help out if they encounter some troubles. Um, so that idea of being able to um, problem solve in difficult situations, that executive functioning would be a particularly important um, aspect, I think, of cognitive functioning for someone trying to do home dialysis. It might do okay if it's just kind of the routine, but if something goes wrong and they've got alarms going on or their machine's not working, it's important that they would be able to engage in that problem solving behavior to take appropriate action. Yeah. Um, the next one, I'm going to group a few questions together. Um, is there research out there about cognitive impairment um, on pancreas transplant, multi-organ transplant, and then um, long-term um, transplant survivors, survival, so beyond just the first year post-transplant? Yeah, so I'll speak to the last part first. Um, there is and some of the research that I um, included in these slides here was with patients, you know, not just a year, but three years and five years out. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how much research we have with patients um, further out than that. And a lot of it is just because we, we have more trouble keeping track of them. Um, you know, once you, once you get 20 years out and we're seeing you once a year, or maybe you've transferred your care back to your, you know, your local provider, it makes it more difficult to kind of keep track and to do some research with those longer term outcomes. Um, as far as the multi-organ and pancreas um, information, if there is information out there, I would imagine it's quite sparse. Um, because even just the information on, you know, single organ um, and organ specific cognitive functioning is not, not robust. Um, so if it's out there, it, I would imagine it's probably a, a case of two patients that they looked at or, or something to that extent, because there's just not as much of that happening. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question is two questions and grouping together also, and I do want to preface this for participants that there are patients, caregivers, and professionals on this call, so this one is more related um, to professionals, and um, the question is what tests are typically done for cognitive testing, and how is, what would be the best way to explain why these tests would be needed or done? Yeah, that's a good question. So I will say um, that cognitive testing is not a part of, um, of most transplant centers typical practice for every patient in evaluation. Um, we, they, um, Society for Transplantation did a survey and all of the centers or a majority of the centers said they thought it was really important and that cognitive functioning was really important, but it was like a very small percentage of them that were actually engaged in doing regular cognitive testing with patients as part of the pre-transplant evaluation process. Um, the, the heart transplant folks did it more frequently than, than anyone else, um, but it still is not a common practice. Um, I think that should change, um, but we off, uh, often have to think about the consequences and, and how we're using and sharing that information too. Um, typically, I would say that, you know, with any sort of testing, we kind of start with a screener, right? You start with the, the easiest test first and then go from there if there are further things to explore. So something like a MOCA or an MMSE um, might be pretty quick and quick and easy just to detect like, you know, are there, is there any cognitive impairment there that you wanna explore further to see if there are particular domains that are being affected? Um, and then, you know, you might go on to something like an R band or something like that, that kind of does look at um, a, a few more of the, the specific domains and you can kind of parse it out a little bit better. So that would be my recommendation for where to start. 
Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so a few people asked, would cognitive impairment be impacted by like length of transplant surgery or length of time under anesthesia? So from the research that I saw, um, those were not specifically um, related to level of cognitive impairment. Um, one of the things that was, was the cold ischemic time of the organ that you receive, um, which is rather interesting. Um, but that that was more related to cognitive impairment. And, and there wasn't any study that specifically related um, anesthesia length, length of time to cognitive impairment. Okay, thank you. Um, and then a few people also asked, is it possible that certain immunosuppressant um, medications post-transplant might impact um, cognitive functioning? So I think I, I did a little preface in the beginning about this. There is some um, preliminary research about you know, the various immunosuppressants that you'll take after transplant. And there was some initial thought that one particular one might affect cognitive functioning more than another, um, but the research just never really parsed out to say that that was true. Um, anything that you put into your body can affect your brain, um, but we don't have uh, solid evidence that um, the immunosuppressants, one versus the next, are differentially affecting cognitive functioning. Got it. Thank you. Um, so I, you did address this at the end of your presentation, but I, a few people, um, had asked, and I just want to include this. So, um, they had asked if memory loss or other in cognitive impairment is reversible and like, what can they do to help it? And I just want to remind everyone that we will send out the recording. So all of the tips that were, um, included will be available in that. And, um, do you just want to address really quickly again, um, the pre versus post, um, you know, how not the specifics um, or stats, but that there is typically an improvement for the most yeah. part. <laughs> yeah, of course, there, there, there is typically an improvement um, from pre to post as you have a new functioning organ that is doing what your body needs um, for, for that particular organ, right? Whether it's providing blood or cleaning your blood or whatever that organ does. Um, so we do see improvements from the pre to post side. Um, and some of the things that are mentioned kind of at the end of things that you can do are ways that you can kind of improve your brain's functioning and your memory. Some of those, you know, little kind of easy tasks or things like that can, can certainly impact um, how your brain is doing and kind of get it, get it fired back up and get there's get those neurons um, firing again. Um, sometimes there is cognitive impairment that is not reversible, um, but that is much more rare. Okay, thank you. Um, and then another person asked is, Salid, is there a connection between quality of sleep and cognitive functioning? Hmm. Because some medications can often cause disruptions in sleep. Yeah, I mean, there, there definitely is, I'm not, not exactly sure what you mean by quality of sleep, but I'll just kind of speak to it. If you're not getting good sound sleep in all of the stages of sleep that you are supposed to, um, then that can certainly affect cognitive functioning. And so, yes, we know that lots of medications have lots of side effects, but sleep is not something that you want to sacrifice. Um, and I would encourage talking with your provider to see, you know, if, some change can be made to that medication or if another medication could be added or you know maybe you just have some poor sleep hygiene habits that can be addressed to help you um, make sure that you're getting good restful sleep at night um, because we do know that sleep can affect your cognitive functioning for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and two last questions. Um, one, what asked is there are there any warning signs that patients or families should look out for post transplant? Huh, that's a good question. Um, and I think you know it. I think the idea is just to be observant, um, and you know your loved one, you know better than their providers do right? Maybe you don't know every inch of their liver, like their, you know, hepatologist or their transplant surgeon does. Um, but you know how they act, you know how they interact, um, and what's typical for them. 
And so, you know, I would just encourage you to be observant um, for any changes that you notice and to report those to, to your transplant team. I can't say that there is any, any particular um, kind of like early warning signs or things like that to look out for, but just kind of looking for any, any sort of changes. Um, with the caveat of, as I mentioned, not being hyper vigilant or like so keenly attuned that you're like, oh, did he did he twitch his nose differently than he did before? <laughs> um, because nose twitching probably isn't isn't a big deal. <laughs> um, and then last question um, for today. So, is balance impacted by cognitive impairment? So balance is is impacted by kind of the the inner ear um, oftentimes and 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 is connected to the brain, but I don't think that the type of you know kind of cognitive impairment that we're talking about here that those things are are necessarily related. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm so sorry we weren't able to get to everyone's questions. Um, I will send them to Dr. Engel. I will say some of them. Um, might be more specific to your care and will probably be referred back to your transplant team, um, but we'll see what we can do. Um, I also am not able to pull the participant list while this is on. I didn't realize this is the first time we're doing a, a, a raffle, but once we close this, someone will win this beautiful Gift of Life Family House water bottle. So I'll do a raffle when we close it and then um, the winner will be emailed. So just look out for that. Everyone will also be emailed an evaluation. They're really helpful for us in um, assessing how these go. This was our biggest one so far. We had over 220 participants. So thank everyone. Thank you everyone for participating and being so engaged and asking a lot of questions. Um, and thank you again to Dr. Engel for this amazing presentation. Um, it was, you can see from the comment, so well received and, and um, I think very meaningful to everyone. So thank you so much. Awesome, thank you for having me. Everyone have a great rest of the day and rest of the week. Take care.